hey, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but fantasy news, it kind of just flows. Welcome, 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 everybody, to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host, Daniel Green, and today we have what I would consider a proper standard format of fantasy news that we are going to go ahead and dissect as if it was a recently deceased frog on a middle school science table. Was that a weird way to start this? What else do you expect? Without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into the first story of the day, which is going to be a cover reveal from Orbit Books for The Oleander's Sword by Tasha Suri and Oh, I love these bold, attention-grabbing covers. Orbit, I know I just constantly talk about their covers, but they just, they massacre it. God damn! They just make it good. I still haven't made a whole Orbit section of my bookshelf, but I'm, I'm genuinely considering it. I just, I don't want to reorganize all my shelves again. It takes, it's a surprisingly difficult. And with this kind of description of the book, y yeah, y you got me intrigued to say the least. And speaking of Orbit covers, we also had The Justice of Kings by Richard Swan. I, okay, imagery, here. Vibe, check. I love it. I don't know why I went from here to check, but that's where we're going. Moving on. A lot of you have been asking me when the audiobook for Rebels Creed is going to be released, and all I can say is early next year, probably January, because it's still in beta review, and I have to get approval for its release, so it's going to take some time. Sorry about that. Next news. Now, I know I am generally a little negative on a lot of sequels and remakes we get here in the news, and I'm sorry if I ever am kind of a bummer on something you're excited for, but I'm eager to say this one for some reason I'm kind of excited about. And what we have is a sequel to the beloved sci-fi hit, Attack the Block. The director was recently on a podcast where he said that he hopes to begin production on the sequel in 2022, and there's just something, something in this area, right? here is telling me this is going to be good for some, I don't know why I can't place it, but it doesn't feel like a cash grab. It doesn't feel like the story's done. There's clear directions. You can go with attack the block in an interesting narrative way. And I'm hoping we see this live up to the first movie, which I recommend if you have not watched again, I, I cannot justify my, for some reason, excitement for this beyond belly. And yeah, of course I need to talk about the fact that we got the drop for the Witcher season two trailer. And it, it was a good trailer. I was a bit curious about the song choice. No, no problem with the song. I just, it didn't fit tonally for me, but I guess it kind of did work. But if you haven't seen it for yourself, you'll, you'll be surprised by what you hear when you start the trailer. But overall, it looked like a good trailer and gave me hope that what I've been talking about since season one dropped of a step up in quality will be present, not only because they seem to have a slightly more forgiving production time than season one, which was just bam, put on out. But, but in addition to that, it just seems like, you know, as shows, especially fantasy shows that have so much to tackle and build lore in season one, move into their season two, they have more wiggle room and flexibility to kind of actually explore stories in more nuanced detail. That's just obviously like a general trend for fantasy worlds that have to build so much. But I have a lot of actual high expectations for season two of The Witcher, despite feeling like season one was just a really solid six. And people say six means I hate it, so now a bunch of people are gonna be mad at me. That just, the internet has ruined rating things. I blame video game reviews. Moving on. Now, in interesting survival sci-fi game news, it seems that the PUBG parent company has acquired the studio behind Subnautica. And the only reason I I am covering this is to say if you haven't played Subnautica and you're a fan of survival games, do it. It's an absolute blast to play and uh, it's an absolute blast to play and it's gotten probably the most jump scares out of me of any game without being a horror. Maybe it is a horror game. God, it sure has made me shriek bloody murder on occasion. That, that game can terrify. And it's one of those games that also came out and was good enough on release, but has had just new things added and added and added to make it just one of the best bang for your buck values for a game I can think about in terms of just investment in time recently. It, it's truly a blast. All right, let's, I can't, let's talk about the, th I can't talk, let's mention, the, okay. Ugh. Wheel of Time images were leaked, but it seems like everyone who's talking about them or posting them is having just 
pulled like just across the board, which, you know, I don't blame the studio. It's their property. They're allowed to say, no, we don't want that out yet. It's a little frustrating. I can't talk about it. If you want to find it online, I'm sure you can do it on your own. I'm not including it in today's video because I, I can't afford to have like a whole day's wages just gone. So sorry, but hey, I'm bringing your attention to it next news, which, you know, it's going to be Wheel of Time news as well, because we also had some of the cast sitting down and doing kind of a interview on how they approached the roles, which was interesting to see how these actors view the characters, especially uh, Yosha Stradowski, who seemed to have some interesting th thoughts on Rand not necessarily being a hero, which was just kind of, I don't know, it, it was, it gave me faith that these people really did a lot of research to understand these characters they're adapting for this gargantuan fantasy epic. But hey, if you're here for negative, Daniel, don't worry, because the Prince of Persia remake for Sands of Time has been delayed. Again. Yes, they had that trailer drop a while back that everyone kind of compared to like PS2 360 graphics saying, how is this a remake? And yeah, if I had to take a shot, an educated shot into the somewhat illuminated dark, I would assume they're probably just fundamentally restructuring the remake of this game. I had one curiosity in the back of my head of like, okay, if the remake they were planning on releasing didn't have that much better graphics, maybe they were releasing a remake that just had way better gameplay and like a smooth smoother experience in that sense. And just purely as a thought exercise, how would you feel about that approach to a remake? We see so many now where they essentially don't touch the gameplay, but just crank the graphics way up. Would you actually like it more or the same if instead of remaking the graphics, all companies did was go back and touch up the gameplay of some games that maybe haven't aged perfectly in terms of how they handle in the modern times compared to games now that run like butter. I don't know, it's just a thought. How would you feel about that approach? And sinking into just Purely negative, Daniel. We had Skyrim the Anniversary Edition and Upgrade Overview announced video thing put on IGN and just how? I wanna make one thing clear. I'm not necessarily buying into the hate for Skyrim being ported to all kinds of different stuff and all that. I actually like having Skyrim on my Switch. It's fun to be able to play when I'm walking about. But what I'm actually kind of frustrated about is the fact that they have remade Skyrim, done all these different ports, crazy amounts of stuff for this, and they have not touched so many other brilliant games in their back catalog that could have a similar treatment. And this is the most justified one for Skyrim by far, because it's an anniversary edition, I get it. But it's just like, this game's been done enough and these incremental improvements compared to like the mods that are out there aren't going to really bring a whole lot new to the table so why not give us like a whole new new vegas that'd be fantastic remaster that i'd be interested there but here it's just like get, get, get morrowind anything else this is the one that we've done enough for. We know what this get. Now I wanted to go ahead and switch on over to talking about some streaming service news. And I know I do this a good amount on fantasy news and it's largely due to the fact that these streaming services are often the ones bringing these sci-fi fantasy adaptations to us. So I just kind of feel like it naturally folds on in. But if a majority of you just don't care about streaming service news, let me know. I, I don't want to waste your time. I happen to find this stuff interesting, but if a lot of you don't, I'll, I'll cut that. I'll cut it right on out. I'll just lop it off. But what I want to talk about here specifically is in a similar vein to how we saw Amazon apparently constructing a 350,000 square foot studio for the Wheel of Time adaptation they're working on, we have also seen Netflix apparently drop bids on Fort Mammoth Army Base in New Jersey as a new studio. Wow, the 89 acre location seems to be a pretty good natural fit to run a studio out of with multiple projects going on. I'm sure there's plenty of storage and space. And I don't know, it's just, it's fascinating to me to see streaming services that, you know, Netflix when I was younger was just kind of looked at as this little DVD rental that was maybe competition for Blockbuster. And now they're one of the most recognized companies in the world and they're buying up former army bases for their own original shows. Times changed. And in the last bit of streaming service news we're gonna talk about, it seems that HBO has decided that's kind of had a mixed amount of success with that simultaneous HBO Max theater release they've been playing with, or Warner Brothers, I should say, because it seems they're going to commit to at least having movies in theaters for 45 days before putting them on their streaming service. They've had some real successes with simultaneous releases. I don't think anyone is truly foundationally disappointed with, for example, Dune's box office, but, 
it does seem to me to make sense to at least have them in theaters for a while before just dropping them on your streaming service platform. Because I personally, while I did go to the theater to see Dune, also saw it with a bunch of people for the first time just sitting down in front of a TV and watching it. And yes, they probably do care about that subscription sign up that that person still has. I have myself one as well. But that many missed ticket sales is also a lot of money gone in the upfront of a movie instead of the, yeah, in many months, we might get as much from this person's subscription as we would have gotten if all those people went to the theater now. And in the final piece of news we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna have a possible piece of news that's the future of gaming or just another gimmick at a giant studio that will blow by like oh so many others. Specifically, the headline reads, Universal Studios Japan Monster Hunter attraction will let you hunt in VR. So Monster Hunter, for those of you unaware, is a successful video game franchise and kind of brand on its own. And this looks like it'll be a immersive VR experience that lets you go and hunt these gargantuan monsters in VR. I have had some experience in VR and what I have found is there are some truly breathtaking moments, but in general home VR systems, at least from the people I know who have spent the money to get them, often end up collecting dust on shelves, aside from being brought out to show off to friends on occasion, especially because like myself, Itself, many people are very prone to headaches and motion sickness with them. But a lot of the best experiences or the true like next cutting edge stuff I've seen has been stuff at studios like this, where they truly tailor the experience to this one specific thing, maybe have some specific props you're actually holding to bring in more of that physicality to overcome those final hurdles of immersion that home VR sets often struggle with. If I had to take my shot in the dark, I believe we will see more VR places like this opening up that provide specific experiences experiences that are so immersive because they are building around this one type of gameplay and the home kits will continue to improve but service a more utility base at least in my opinion this is just a neat another little blip though that goes in the direction i've thought things possibly will be stepping towards but i'm very willing to be wrong here because i'm not an expert in vr I was a software engineer for a while but that's like it. I, I had some VR kits, I got rid of them because they just weren't for me, and by God, did my eyes burn after a while. But this has been your latest episode of Fantasy News. Like and subscribe if you have not already, and hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. Have a good one, y'all. Peace.